using the lies of the enemy, right? So we all know that the enemy, he's always trying to, 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 he's trying to come into our lives, creep into our lives when we're saved, but also when we're in the world, right? He's always trying to pull a fast one on us, and we're, we're here. We're going to have this special panel. We're going to be interviewing three different people here today, uh, hearing about their testimonies, right, about when they were surrounded by darkness and when the light came and shone on their life. Hallelujah. And I, I want to just introduce myself. My brother's name is Brother Matthew, and Gabby doesn't need any introduction, but Sister Gabby here today. Hallelujah. At this time, we can go ahead and welcome up our panel. Uh, guess if we can all stand and give them a warm welcome. Okay, you guys can be seated. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we're going to have them um, go ahead and introduce themselves. And then they'll also give a brief testimony because uh, each of them, they were picked for a specific reason. And they each have different backgrounds. You know, in our ministry, we have people from... Uh, all different types of testimonies, different backgrounds, but it's beautiful because God can bring us all together in an environment like this. So I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Christian Montiel. Uh, one, uh, thank God for my salvation. Um, I come from a past of, uh, I grew up in church. I grew up in a Christian home. It wasn't perfect. It was broken. And um, when I came of age, I, uh, before I came of age, I started to, you know, I, I, I smoked at seven years old. I was lost. Uh, I saw a lot of abuse growing up. And uh, even though I lived in a Christian home, you know, the devil had a grisp in my family, a, gra a grab in my family. And um, he just, uh, I went my own way and I got lost. And then um, by the grace of God, you know, um, I came here to uh, Washington with my wife and uh, God, uh, God brought me back. You know, I was a prodigal son and uh, God brought me back. Amen. Amen. Um, my name is Courtney. Um, so when I was younger, I used to be in foster care. I used to get neglected from my parents. And um, there was like a short time in my life where we were like homeless, like jumping from place to place. It was my whole family. And um, it was just like a lot of neglect that I have faced. And then there was also a portion of my life where um, I was drinking a lot and I was very young. And I started smoking weed when I was very young. And uh, it was just like a, not a good time in my life. But that's the gist of my testimony. Amen. Uh, my name is Deanna. Um, growing up, my parents, they didn't really, like, take us to church. If they did, it would be, like, this church, that church, like, on Easter, on Christmas. And um, after my parents split up um, and divorced and my dad moved, I felt really abandoned and rejected, like I wasn't wanted. And then my mom began to just kind of do her own thing, and it left me to fend for my younger siblings, you know, cooking for them, taking care of them, making sure they were okay. And, you know, in my time of growing up, like I was abused um, physically, emotionally, and sexually. And that led me to, you know, when I turned, when I was like in seventh grade, I started smoking weed, I started drinking, I started looking for love in all the wrong places. And um, I just carried that on until somebody told me about Jesus and that, like, I didn't have to look to the things of the world to be fulfilled, but that the love of God was able to fulfill me. And when I began to open my heart and just surrender, I understood it. Because people would say to me, and I'm like, okay, like, that's cool. But when I opened my heart and I surrendered and I experienced and I encountered the love of God, I was never the same. Amen. Hallelujah. What a, what a powerful testimony, right? Uh, I always heard that God puts you through the test, right, so that he can use your testimony, right? And there's such a powerful testimony within each and every one of these people here. And uh, before we get into it, we're just going to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, we're just going to pray in. And, uh, Father God, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just place you at the center, God, of everything that we're doing here tonight, Father God. God, I pray, God, that you open up the hearts of your people here tonight. God, let the, let the testimonies, God, be a, a testament of your goodness and your love, Father God. I pray, God, let your people have their hearts open to what you want to do here tonight, Father God. 
And God, I pray, God, that you get all the honor and you get all the glory. In the name of Jesus, we all say amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, so we're going to get into our first question. The first question will be, what has been one of the darkest times you faced as a believer? So we've heard what you guys have faced growing up before you knew Christ, but today we want to hear what you've faced that is a dark moment as a believer. Amen. Um, <clears throat> as a believer, uh, one of the darkest moments I faced was um, losing my parents, uh, losing my mom, losing my dad, and uh, just, uh, yeah, just uh, feeling that loss as an adult, as a young adult, and, uh, you know, just wondering why. coming to church and um, and my dad so it was either a choice between serving God or continuing the life that I was like living which was not something I would wish upon anybody but it was a time and my dad was saying to me he was like he was like if you leave this house I never want to see you again you are no longer part of my family I don't ever want to see you talking to any of your siblings like nothing he was he was calling me all kinds of names and just calling me a traitor and all of this stuff. And it was it was the hardest time because I had to stick it out. I had I made a choice and I was like, no, I know that there's better. I know that God has a plan for my life. And it was it was the hardest time, but I'll tell you what, it's the best. And then I feel like um, I just wanted to share this, like uh, you know, there's, we could go through things, and there could be, like, man-made trials, you know? But tonight, we're talking about real trials, like, stuff that we face that's out of our control. And for me, that was something, like, for my situation of my hardest time, like I said, I took care of my brother and my sister, so they're like my kids. So seeing them struggle, you know, um, our family has generational curses of alcoholism, and seeing them struggle in, in their their addiction and knowing that I have the answer and but they wouldn't take it and some things had took place um, last year with my niece and I was like man like it was hard for us because our family were so close and to see my niece knowing that she was hurt and then seeing that my brother was gonna go down even a worth worse pass you know our path you know like in his alcoholism and in, in his feeling suicidal moments and like feeling like I have no control over it. Those were my darkest moments of, of just, you know, knowing that I had the answer, but they wouldn't receive it. I'm like, man, like Jesus could set you free. Like, and as much as I would want to just like, come on, just come to the feet of Jesus. Like they wouldn't. And it was so hard to watch them struggle and go through their torment and go through the things that they faced and knowing that I had the answer, but they wouldn't receive it. Amen. So as you guys can see from their lives, we see that um, when you don't only go through battles before you get saved, but you also will face dark times as a believer. But we know that with Christ, that it's easier to face the battles. We heard from Christian that he's faced the loss of not one parent, but two parents as a believer. Courtney has faced battles with her family that came against her. So some of you, you guys might be able to resonate, and we hope that it ministers to you. And also Deanna and believing for the salvation of her siblings. Hallelujah. So, Brother Christian, I just want to ask you, and I know you, you said you lost both your parents, and I, I kind of had a similar similar battle as well. But was there any moment where you felt, like, resentment or a feeling of, like, man, God, you're not good, right? Like, what kind yeah. of feelings did you have about that? I think it was, uh, so I lost both my parents to cancer. I lost my dad in uh, 2009, and um, I thought he was the strongest man alive. I saw him work. I saw him serve God. Once he gave his life to God. I saw him go through the trials of losing his strength and losing eventually, you know, uh, dying in hospice in my living room. And then um, years later passed, I, I got lost. And, and then my mom, uh, we found out my mom had cancer. And, it was, and they both died in December. One died on December 18th, and the other one passed away on December 24th. So the December has always been a weird year, but I remember being mad at God um, because both my parents were believers. They had both given their life to Christ. 
resented, uh, for a moment, I resented God. And um, I was more locked in when my mom passed away. I was here in the garage. And, um, but I just remember seeing her pray, seeing her worship and her pain. And, you know, people praying for her and, you know, just expecting a miracle. You know, expecting a miracle and believing that God, that the, that the, God, the, blood, of, the blood of Jesus has power to heal just because he has the power to heal doesn't mean it's for that person because God has a plan for every person but when she passed away I just remember being mad at God and my salvation you know asking him why you know there's so many people praying so many churches praying and you took her you know you took you took my only parent you took my somebody that was trying to you know help and she was living with me and I just remember feeling resentment towards God and then after that feeling resentment, resentment towards myself little thing became huge in my mind, and uh, I lost a part of myself in that, era, in that, in that stage, you know, so it was mad at God and mad at myself for something that I didn't have control of. Um, um, one thing that helped me, and if you guys want to write this down, it's uh, found in Isaiah 55, right, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, right, it says, just as, as the heavens are higher than the, the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my, thought, and my ways greater than your ways, and that always helped me, because I always asked why, why, God, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I'm serving you, my parents served you, and you still took them, right, and uh, yeah, God does things for a reason, right, uh, thank you, thank you for sharing, bro. Okay, real quick, before we continue on to the next um, question, we just have some announcements, uh, we're going to be having our Holy Ghost party next week. So next Friday, we're going to have, like, a battle with all the tears. We're going to have a special time to just be together. And then we also have a Run for Hope fundraiser tomorrow. It's our last push for Run for Hope. Um, okay, so now we have our next question. I asked Courtney. <laughs> okay, so um, you've already shared kind of like a dark moment that you've had in your walk with God. But what were some of the emotions and thoughts that you had at that time? And um, how did you overcome those thoughts? Okay, um, I was feeling really alone because the only people, like, I don't have a lot of people in my life. I've moved, like, every two years since I was, like, born. So I've never kept any friends. Like, I always cut people off because it was going to happen anyway. And so I didn't, I don't have any friends, like, well, I do now, but, like, I didn't, and the only people that I have is my immediate family. My dad's an only child, and my uncles and my grandparents are not a part of my life from my mom's side. And so all I have is, like, my mom, my dad, my sisters, and my brothers. And so for my dad to be like, no more, you're done, you're cut off, I didn't have any more family. So I was, I was alone. I felt like I had no hope that nobody wanted me, that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna make it because I didn't have anybody's back and they didn't have mine. And I, it was, it was so overwhelming to feel so alone. And um, something that helped me is I was living in a discipleship home at the time with Alma and Roger, and I remember one time I was like, I was complaining to Alma. I was like, so alone and I was like and I was telling her I was like I hate my dad I hate him for what he did I was like I just want him to want me I just want him to be a dad he was never he was never a dad before that like he was in and out of my life constantly and and I was I was like just like pouring my heart out to her and she was like she was like stop she was like you need to go pray and I was like girl what the heck (laughs) I need to let this out and she was like no let it out to God and so I did I remember I was sitting in like my room and it was like pitch black and I turned up my my radio like all the way in the stereo and I was just crying out to God and I was like God please I was like all I want is the salvation of my dad I was like man God I need you in this time I was like I feel so alone I just need you to be there for me I need you to bring peace in my life I need you to comfort me because I can't comfort myself right now and he was like 
He showed up and he brought peace and he brought like a refreshment. It was just amazing. But it took me stepping out and getting into prayer. And it took, it wasn't just that time, but it was time and time again where God continued to, to bring the peace into my life. Uh, I like how she said, I think one of the most important things that she said is that she ran to God. She tried to run to man, but man pointed her to God. And that knowing that God, he wants you. That And I believe it's Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It says, it says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. And let me take upon your, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, um, let me take upon your burdens. You take my yoke and I'll take your yoke. For my yoke is light and your burdens are heavy. And that's what God says to us, that those are Jesus' very words, that his word says that come to me and I will give you rest. I want to take on your burdens. I want to take on your sorrow, your pain, your everything. But it takes you to step into it and to seek him. And like she said, it wasn't just one day, that one moment that she broke down and gave it to God. But it's something that she had to learn to give it to him every day and surrender every day. Because, you know, healing is a process. Letting go, it, 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 you may be able to let go one day, but sometimes, you know, it takes months and years and, and it, you gotta continue to go to God hallelujah hallelujah and I, that takes us to our, our third question right it says was there a specific turning point that brought light into your situation I think you hit it on the head where you know you're vocalizing your frustrations to people but you know you're supposed to take it to God right so I just want to ask sister Deanna uh, was there a specific turning point that brought light into your situation what sparked that change, and how did it unfold? Um, I think for <clears throat> my moment, it was almost, it had to get worse before it could get better. It had to take something really, really, like, a big struggle, you know, because like I said, I was believing for my brother. He was bound to alcoholism. Some things had taken place with my niece, and you know, he was in and out of court, you know, because he was, you know, going through the trials of, um, you know, custody, not only that, but the persecution for the person who had harmed her. And um, so it took a dark, dark moment. And I remembered my sister-in-law called me and she was distraught. And she was like, man, she's like, my brother's name is Edwin. She's like, um, he's, he's blackout drunk right now. And he just took off. Like, Sorry, I am. Like he just took off. He just took a paper and a pen and his gun. I don't know if he's going to kill somebody or himself. He turned off his phone, and I remember that moment. I was like, man, God, I, I had no hope. I was so, I was scared. The enemy had me, like, scared. I was fearful because I'm like, man, God, like, my, I can't lose my brother. I can't lose him like this. And I remember I was sitting there, and I was crying, and I couldn't even pray because the enemy had lied to me so much that it was over. In that moment, I believed it was over. I believed that I was about to lose my brother. And I remember I called Sister Jessica, and I was like, Sister, I have no hope right now. I don't even know what's like. I, I'm just, you know, I know I was talking to my husband. We're like, come on, let's go start looking around. But... I had to come to the realization that it was nothing we were going to do. What were we going to do? Pull up and talk him out of it? No, it had to take the power of God. And in that moment, like, I felt so hopeless, but I had somebody that I could turn to. And I had somebody that I had a relationship with that I could say, you know, sister, like, I'm about to lose my brother. Like, you know, he's out missing with his gun right now. And I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I remember, like, she just prayed for me. And I felt peace in that moment because I'm like, okay, God, we're putting it in your hands. I know that you're a God who's faithful. And I know you're a God who's able. And, and I really thought in that moment I was going to lose my brother. But God turned it around. It took that moment of desperation of us saying, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. I'm sick and tired of seeing my family being lied to. I'm sick and tired of seeing my family being stuck in bondage. And I declared war on the enemy. And I began to take my family to fasting. I began to take them to prayer. I would stay long times in my prayer closet. And I began to make declarations over his life. 
And I don't know if I'm answering a further question, but now he's saved. I got to witness him be baptized. But it took that dark moment of me feeling hopeless, being reminded that he is able. And I took it to war. I didn't take it on to, brother, you got to do this. Brother, you got to do that. But I left it up to God. And that was our pivotal moment because it was nothing I was going to do. But it was through prayer. It was through fasting. And it was through believing that God was able. And now he's baptized. He has a fire in him. He's serving God. He's joyful. I see smiles on his face like he's never had before. Never. And he has freedom now. So it took something even worse happening for a turnaround because I put it in God's hands. And wait, before you pass the mic, how long uh, have you prayed for your brother's salvation? Since I've been saved um, in 2011. And I would sit there and I would minister to him and I would tell him, like, I would invite him to church, invite him to church, invite him to church. And he's like, it's okay, I pray, you know, that spirit of religion. He's like, it's okay, I pray. Like, it's okay. Like, you know, I pray. I don't have to go to church. And I would just try and try. And, and it just came to a point where I became hopeless. I was like, and I started to look in the tangible of, okay, some people serve God and some people don't. And I started to believe that for my family. But then God had to remind me, no, salvation is for everybody. And so I had to just turn off the me trying and turn on the me praying and believing that God was going to do it. And it was years. I've been praying for my siblings for years, since 2011. And the beginning of this year is when I made my declaration. I remember Gabby, she met with the gang girl leaders and, and she gave us, um, she gave us uh, some goals. And she said, what are you declaring this year? And one of my declarations was that my brother was going to be set free and that he was going to be baptized. And back in April, I got to go to the church that he goes to and I got to sit there and I got to witness him be washed in the water. And it's all because of my declaration and, and not giving up. So if you're believing for a family tonight, don't give up. Don't give up. Like I said, I was hopeless. I thought it would never happen. I thought he would never stop drinking. I thought he would never give his life to Jesus. And now he's at a point where he wants to tell people about Jesus. Amen. I, I put um, Deanna's testimony on believing for her siblings. is such a powerful testimony that uh, hopefully it can be an encouragement to some of you that are also believing. She's been believing since 2011. It's 2024. That's, that's a very long time. Sometimes... God, God will meet your prayers like that, and sometimes he'll, he'll have you wait because he wants to see your faith through it. He wants to see uh, if you're willing to wait. And now she declared this year, and I think it's so important that, um, that we declare, that we believe for things. We're not just saying, okay, God, I know that you're going to move in this, and we're forcing God, but we're believing. So you know what, God? I declare that my siblings will be saved, and I'm going to keep believing. Declaring is I'm choosing to believe until you come through in this. And that's what she did. And so it's so uh, it's, it's so cool to see that that was a goal that she met. And as soon as that her brother gave his life over, she texted me, and I was like, man, that, that, that's such a miracle from God that she chose so this year I'm gonna fight. This year I'm gonna believe until God comes through in this area. And God met her, and God came through in this area. And I remember, um, and I've heard from one uh, like a preaching before. So they were saying how it's some for some of us it's easy to believe for the drug addict to be saved. It's easier for us to believe the newcomer to be committed to be saved, but. For some of us, we forget to believe for our siblings. For some of us, we forget to believe for our families or we think that they're just lost causes or they're never going to take it because we know them. We know all their dirt. We know everything the way they think. But never lose hope. Just like you believe for the unsaved, the ones that you don't know, then how much more so should we continue to believe for our family? And so um, we'll go ahead and ask the next question. Okay, um, so the next question is, were there any moments where you doubted whether li the light would ever come, and how did you handle those feelings of er uncertainty? Yes, sir. And then, um, I doubted in the, in my, when my dad passed away first, uh, I doubted, right? And, um, 
I ended up uh, falling into depression. Uh, obviously, you know, when something dies, it hurts. Um, I wasn't really saved, so it hurt even more. And I doubted, you know, that there was going to be a change. I didn't know. I was lost. You know, I just lost my dad. And, and then when I lost my mom, I was in a different area. You know, I was saved. And, and that doubt tried to creep in. The depression, it creeped in. But, um, you know, there was a change. There was a pivot right there where, where, where I sought God and I said, you know what? I've been through this before. It hurts. But uh, what kept me and what? the light in that area where I didn't go back was the, the body of Christ. You know, I had a church, I had a pastor, I had brothers. Before I only had my family and we were all broken. But this time I had a whole church on my back. I had a, I had a pastor who was praying for me. I had brothers who were holding me. I had brothers who were going through the same battle with me. And and, and, and I remember just being like, all right, God, I'm going to go through the motions because I just lost my mom, but I'm not going to doubt who you are. I'm not going to doubt who you are in my life because you took my mom, because it was her time. But um, just to piggyback off some of the stuff, you know, I didn't just lose my mom because she died and it was her time. But because there was, like like brother said, that uh, it's not on our own understanding why, why things happen, why we lose family members. You know, God, God does things for a reason. And, um, and as painful as it was, there was victory behind it, you know. Um, we had a sister. I have a sister. And she was like the black sheep of the she left church at a really early age, and then um, when my mom passed away, God told her, I, I heard, I saw Pastor Tim Rivera at the hospital with my mom just passed away, and he goes, um, he looked at her, and he goes, you see the angels, don't you? And in that moment, I knew well, she's leaving, she's leaving, she's, she's not going to be here, and it was a conversation that she exchanged, and she said yes, and then he goes, uh, God has one more mission for you, man. One more soul, and I was just like broken. I was like, well, God already knew what it was, and she knew who it was. And that person was my sister, and um, she had been gone for a long time, drinking, and you know, just uh, just living a life of sin, right? And not believing in God and being mad at God for what happened in her youth, and um, losing my mom brought brought her into salvation. And um, and I remember just thinking, wow, God, like my whole family saved. Yes, my mom and my dad are gone, but those people to save and break generational curses and all these things and because of those deaths you know my all my sisters are saved all my all my nephews and my nieces are saved and, uh, and it was that time you know that I could have doubted and I could have you know been mad at God but the, the body of Christ and Jesus always has kept me when my dad passed away I lived with my with my sister who was a pastor's wife for a different ministry God kept me through that season, you know, and then when my mom passed away, you know, I was married uh, to a praying wife, to a very supportive wife, and I said, you know what, it's going to be all right, and, and it was all right, not because my wife or my, my youth had, because God had kept me through every painful situation that I've been through, and, you know, and that's um, when I knew, you know, that Theo was home was... depression and just everything, I had a church to hold me up through the, through, through the season, you know, and the pastor and the brothers and sisters were saying, it's okay, you're, you're going to be all right. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's powerful. And there's one thing that you said uh, that just kind of reminded me of what the pastor would say, like, when, when your mom passed, God was there to greet her, saying, well done, my good and faithful servant, right? And uh, one thing that I it just kind of was dropped in my spirit about um, the passing of a loved one, right? Sometimes it's so hard. It's so hard to deal with, right? But it just reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Where uh, they wouldn't bow down and worship that King Nebuchadnezzar, right? So King Nebuchadnezzar put him in a furnace, heated seven times, right? So he was trying to incinerate them, right? And uh, we all know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the furnace, but there was a fourth person in there, right? It was a spirit, the Holy Spirit, the, the son, of, uh, son of Man was in there with them dancing. And because of that, King Nebuchadnezzar realized it, saw it, and he was saved, right? And it said millions were saved, right? And so it just reminded me of your sister, how her death kind of brought your sister back to the Lord, right? Yes. And that was the super powerful. Sometimes we don't understand what God's doing certain things. 
but it could be for somebody else's salvation, right? It could be to, to bring people closer to him. It could be to get your attention, right? And so that's why I keep going back to Isaiah 55. It's like his thoughts, not our thoughts, and his ways, not our ways, right? Yeah, that's powerful, man. I appreciate it. I just wanted to, like, you know, as he was speaking, there's something I feel like sharing is that what got me through my moment was repentance. Because, you know, we're talking about, you know, what we've been through with Christ. You know, as we're serving God, we know that he's a good God. We know that he's a good father. We know that he's able, that he's all powerful. And I had to come to a place of repentance because I began to forget that. I began to allow lies to take my focus that God is a powerful God, that he's all able. And, and I had to come to a place where I repented that. God, forgive me for forgetting that you're enough. God, forgive me for, for taking my focus off you and on my situation. I had to ask God to forgive me for, for even thinking that he couldn't save my brother. I had to come to a place of repentance. And with the repentance, that's where the light came. Because I was able to see the peace. I was able to see that. Even though I don't see it, I know that you're working, God. Even though I can't see it or I don't know how you're going to do this, I know you're going to do it. So it took me to repent. I had to first repent. God, forgive me for forgetting who you are. Yeah, it just reminds me of Philippians 4, 8, right? It says, don't worry about nothing but through prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. That's good stuff. Uh, Courtney, I have a question for you, right? Um, my question is, how did the people around you influence your journey from darkness to light? And were there specific individuals who played a key role in your breakthrough? in Seattle and then Gabby was like okay but when are you coming back here I was like I'm not and she was like no you are and I was like okay amen like like I'll go <laughs> but she was like no you're coming back in January she kept telling me she, you're coming back in January she's like I don't care you're coming back and I was like okay I'll come back and I did I came back in January and uh, she was there throughout everything I don't think that I would have come back if it hadn't been for Gabby. I don't think that I would be where I'm at if it wasn't for her encouraging me and being there with me. Uh, oh, sorry guys, I really don't like Gabby. <laughs> but, um, but no, like if I if I didn't have her there like throughout those times, I would have been like, okay, well, God doesn't even care about me. God doesn't that church doesn't want me. They don't want me there. Why would I go back? Even though I felt the tug to go back the moment I left. Uh, 
I think what's important in that is um, we're reading this book with the gang girls, and it talks about how we're built for community and how God's command is to love him and to love his people. And that as, as followers of Christ, that we're to represent him. And what is he? He's love. Yes, he, he doesn't like sin, but God doesn't ever come with us, uh, at us with condemnation or shame or guilt. Those are things of the enemy. And so it's so important to, uh, to one, to be that for somebody else, to be that love, to be that light. Because, one, you don't know what somebody may be going through, why they've left or why they've stopped texting you back, whatever it is. But be that one. Be what I, I like the, the saying in um, our ministry is be that, that leader, be that friend that you always wanted for yourself. That, man, I needed somebody that would be on me, that would text me, that would call me, that would show up for me, that would show up when I didn't respond or show up for them. If you want that or expect that in your life, then you must be that first. And, it, and it's so important to know that there's a community here, that there's a community of people that love you despite what you, get, what, what you add to the church, what you done in your past, what you're doing now, whatever it is that you're, the Bible says that nothing on earth, nothing in hell, no demon could separate you from the love of God. So just know that no matter what darkness that may surround you, that nothing will separate you, that nobody knows your business, nobody, um, not in a bad way, but nobody cares what you've done either. We're not here to, if somebody's caring about your business like that, or now that person did that, then they shouldn't, you know, and then God will humble them, God will deal with them. And, and it's so important that, that we love everybody, no matter where they've gone. I know me and Courtney have had a, a friendship that was already built, and we're like, okay, no matter what, we're going to be friends because we both experience people coming in and out of our lives. Hers is in a different way, and I've experienced people coming to the church, getting close to my family, and then leaving out of nowhere without explanation. People that we've loved, people that we've clothed, that we've supported have left us. And so when, when um, me and Courtney, our friendship, we didn't like each other at first, and we decided no matter what, we're, we're going to be friends. And so I know that when she left, that was a painful thing. I was like, no, like, don't leave. Like, don't you know? Like, it's, it's worse out there. Like, it, your job's not worth it. And I would tell her, but I had to accept her decision. And just because she left, I wasn't going to just give up on her. And sometimes when people leave, we'll just say, like, all right, they left. They decided that. Then they decided that. Or they hurt me in this. They hurt me for leaving. Then forget them. But no, we must love God. You know how many times we turned our back on him? How many times we've heard him where he could have said, man, forget that dude. He, he turned his back on me again. And he did it again yesterday. He's going to do it again two years from now. You know, he knows all those things, but he still chooses you. So we must be those models and displays of him that just as he would, that we would love love no matter what. Know that those, you know, that people leave and they come and go for uh, hard reasons, you know, and so we got to love them through it all because your condemnation will, will not win them over. And so we're going to um, finish with this last question. It'll be for Deanna. What advice would you give somebody who is currently in a place of darkness seeking to find light? To take it to prayer. I mean, I know that could sound kind of like, okay, but take it to prayer, take it to fasting, and, and not only that, but you got to believe, you know, the Bible says that if you don't believe, okay, I'm paraphrasing, let me just say that, I like to paraphrase, if you don't believe, what are you asking for, you know, you have to believe, you're asking God, and you need to believe that, that there is a God, first of all, that there is a God, and what you're asking of him, that he is able to do it, because you could ask all you want, but if you don't believe, then he can't come through for you if you don't believe in him and that he's able. And you have to press in and, and get people around you. Like Sister Gabby was saying, like, it takes community. Like, I know for me, like, the same thing, like, with Courtney, like, I faced that same thing where, where I wasn't being devoted to my prayer life and I lost my identity in Christ. And um, I know Sister Jessica was always there for me and um, <laughs> Brother Anthony, I feel like, 
Brother Anthony, my husband, and myself, we've had a group message since Facebook was first created. <laughs> but, like, he never gave up on us, you know? So he always would message us. Like, he would just send us scripture or, like, invite us out. Like, Gabby was saying that love, you know? You have to have a community. You have to know that, like, you know, your brother and sister, like, sometimes you got to let your guard down. And you got to, like, say, hey, I need a battle partner. You got to find yourself a battle partner, someone who's going to fight and stand and and believe with you whatever you're believing for you're going to have somebody who's going to fast with you who's going to pray with you who's going to believe for you and and that truly has like your best interest in their heart like that's what we're here for is is you know whatever you're believing for whatever you're going through god is able and that's what i like through this season it was hard it was hard to to see the effects of the abuse that my niece endured it was hard to witness that but now i see god moving and giving her healing. It was hard to know that my brother would, would be blacked out drunk and driving and, and almost committing suicide and and like that he had no hope and knowing that he was hurting and I couldn't do anything about it, but God was able because I prayed. And the, the, the what I'm trying to get at is that when you believe and give it to God, he's able no matter what your situation is. And, and we have to know too, like, you know, um, the enemy needs permission before he could come and do whatever he does. Like, you know, he's, even God was like, have you considered Job? You know, the enemy needs permission before anything that you happen. Job went through some hard stuff. He lost his family. He was uh, stricken physically. He lost everything. But he still served God and he never forgot who God was. And God saw him through and blessed him even more. So no matter your situation, know that that. The enemy can't target you without God's permission first. You know, he asked to sift Simon like wheat. I mean, I could only imagine being taken through a sifter. But permission was given first. And right now you may be being sifted by like wheat, but there's permission to that. And, and God, you know, something that I've always learned through every trial is, God, what are you trying to teach me in this? This moment I know is a moment that you're trying to teach me something. So let me take my focus off of how hard it is and let me focus on what you're trying to teach me in this season. Let me focus on what you're doing, not what my trials around me are, but what you're doing in this season and what you're going to, what the outcome's going to be. So just keep fighting, keep pressing in, keep praying and Get yourself some battle partners. Get you some, if you're a gang warrior, get you some down gang warriors who are ready to lift your hands with you. If you're a gang girl, get you some down gang girls who are like, yes, let's do a fast. Let's fast for a week. Let's take it to prayer. Let's go to the prayer closet. Let's stay there all night if we have to. And and look for those people in your life and don't stop fighting and don't stop believing. I was waiting years, years, but God brought that brought it to pass. So don't give up. Amen. We could all stand here tonight. And, you know, you guys heard many stories, many testimonies, and these are all real-life battles that, that people have faced. And just know that, that we have a great team of, of leaders here in our third wave that, that can help you. That if you have other questions that maybe weren't answered or you feel like, hey, you know what, I resonate with that, then feel free to come up to one of us. We're not going to shame you or, or anything, but we want to help you through this. That that's what we're here for, to, to help you and to share the love of God. And like Deanna was saying is that when you're facing darkness, to one, seek God. But if you don't know how to seek God or you feel like believing is getting difficult, then get people around you that you can't do this walk alone. I'll tell you that. You may think you can. You may think I'm independent. Uh, it's hard for me to open up people so I can't. But know that you can't face this walk alone. You need teachers, counselors in your life, those that have been there before you to teach you, to guide you. And you also need peers, those that are at your level that, that are fighting the same walk with you, that are in the same pace with you. And there's people in this room that, that you can lean on, but it's so important that you take that step and you allow God to allow people into your life. You allow him to move your heart and shift your heart and allow him to open.
open you up, you know? Why, 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 uh, why come here if, if you don't want God to do something in your life? Why come to God and, and not give him what everything, you know? Why give him half-hearted things or just a part of me when he wants all of you? When you give him all of you, he'll move greater than you expect, greater than you can anticipate. He'll heal you. He'll reveal things about you that you didn't know. So, uh, so to, uh, tonight, this is all that we have for you, and we're just going to close out on a, time, a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this time and this opportunity that we got to be here with your third wave tonight, God. I pray that as we shed light, God, in the midst of darkness, God, that they would know and understand, my God, that there is hope, that there is a way out, God, that there is power and truth, there is power and vulnerability, that there is power and community, God. I pray that you would shield every third waver within this room, my God, that whatever they're facing, that they would know that you're there waiting for them to run to you, you're there waiting for them to to, to come to you so you may give them peace and rest, God, that you place people around them that will battle with them, God, that they aren't in this fight alone, God. I pray that you would shield them, that you would guard their walk, God, that you would guard their salvation all the days of their life, God. We lift this time into your hands, God, and that you would seal this time, my God. Every word that was spoken, let it meditate and, and continue to flow from their hearts, God. I pray that you would have your way in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we love you. Love you. Amen.